It's Tuesday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. <laughs> Celebrations in Gaza after Hamas accepts a ceasefire deal brokered by the Egyptians and the Qataris. But Israeli troops enter Rafa as Benjamin Netanyahu says the proposal is far from basic requirements. The result of the next general election isn't a foregone conclusion and indeed actually is closer than, or the situation is closer than many people are saying. At this rate, you know, we'll be lucky to have any Conservative MPs at the next election. After last week's local elections, whose verdict is right? And economic green shoots? The Shadow Chancellor doesn't think so. The Conservatives are gaslighting the British public. Joining us today, Shadow Attorney General Emily Thornbury, Conservative MP Paul Scully, Contributing Editor at Navarra Media Ash Sarkar and Director of the centre-right think tank, the Centre for Policy Studies, Robert Colville. This is Politics Live. Let's start uh, with this story that broke overnight. BBC News headline, MOD, Ministry of Defence, data breach China suspected of UK armed forces payroll hack. Yes, this refers to a major data breach where the personal information of a number of serving Royal Navy, Army and Air Force personnel has been accessed in a hack on a payroll system used by the Ministry of Defence. Uh, the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps is expected to update the Commons this afternoon. But my opening question to the panel starting uh, with you, Emily, is are we doing enough to protect ourselves from cyber espionage? Well, clearly not. Um, I remember eight years ago, I was Shadow Defence Secretary, and the first speech I made was about the importance of looking at 21st century threats and ensuring that we could step up to meet them. Because I think that we, that we constantly fall into the habit of, you know, fighting the last war, but we need to, ha we need to be looking at what's threatening us now. And that is, and, and, and if we can't defend the MOD of all mm. places against cyber threats, I mean, we need to be able to step up with the same kind of, you know, it, with, the, with, with the same focus as those powers who are trying to hack into our country. And it isn't just, frankly, the MOD either. It's also things like, like the grid. It's the things like, like the NHS. I mean, there are a whole range of things that we need to be making sure that we prioritise because we have to keep our country safe. And in the 21st century, this is a very important part. Uh, perhaps we'll come on to what can be done, but are, are we doing enough to protect ourselves, or do you agree with uh, Emily? Well, I think that we can always do more in this, because unconventional warfare, including cyber, is, is obviously the, um, the future threat, the main future threat that's going um, to that come in. If you can actually have a war with effectively putting troops on the ground and risking your own troops' lives, then that's the first port of call that uh, um, uh, a bad actor uh, on the global sc stage is going to do. So we need to pump more money in. And um, Emily's right about it. infrastructure. It was only about a decade ago, I think, or, or just more, when the NHS were, were hacked in, because mm. they, they had Windows XP. They had an outdated version of Windows that was no longer being supported. That's, so it's wider than just the Defence Department. We've got to make sure all of our in infrastructure is protected. Do you think we need to do more to protect ourselves? I think that what we're seeing is the consequences of separating foreign policy, defence policy and economic policy. So on the one hand, you've got the government talking about the threats posed by China. On the other hand, we're allowing Chinese oligarchs to, to buy up whole swathes mm. of London to stash their assets here. And I don't think that you can separate those things anymore. Right. What do you think, Robert, in terms of what we can do if we're going to do more to protect ourselves from this sort of thing happening? Sure. Well, we're, we're spending a lot of money on this. I'm sure we will, we will spend more. It, it is the, the huge growth area. The problem is you're only as weak as your weakest link. Um, if in America, we've seen examples of how um, a guy in the Pentagon was on a gaming channel um, and in, in, on, on Discord and just to impress his mates, he was going, hey, look, here, here's what I know about Ukraine. And likewise, um, you know, Russian agents just, just saying, you know, hey, you know um, just, just, just proposing, proposing as or being attractive women and suddenly people falling over themselves to tell them security secrets. Um, I, so I think it's not just a question of um, resources, it's a question of mentality. The uh, former head of the SIS, Nigel Linkster, wrote a really big, good piece on the sheer scale of the information harvesting that's going on and that's being targeted at us. And this isn't just an issue for government to be aware of, it's an issue for businesses to be aware of, it's an issue for all of us to be aware of. We just need to be much more security conscious in our everyday lives. Well, and in terms of the approach towards China, perhaps picking up on what Ash said, um, there is a slight disconnect, um, certainly from Ian Duncan Smith, um, obviously senior Conservative MP, because the government's position on China has moved a long way from the sort of golden era or that language 
language of relations when David Cameron was Prime Minister, although he is, of course, now Foreign Secretary. But IDS, um, as we call him in shorthand, has tweeted this. This is yet another example of why the UK government must admit that China poses a systemic threat to the UK and change the integrated review to reflect that. No more pretense. China is a malign actor supporting Russia with money and military equipment, working with Iran and North Korea in a new axis of totalitarian states. Do you agree with his sentiment there? Uh, to, to an extent, yes. I mean, you know, obviously we've got to uh, um, you know, always re-examine our relationship with China and the threat that it poses. But I, I think when Ash was talking about um, uh, aligning with economic policy and foreign policy, if you park the Chinese oligarch argument for one second, the wider economy, the, the amount that we're reliant on China for our, for our goods that we're importing, uh, means that we can't just have a binary view. We've got to extricate ourselves from that. That will take a period of time. But Grant Shapps himself early on in the year made a speech about the fact that putting yourself in a, not quite a war footing, but, but trying to get the mentality change that Robert was talking well, about. Well, is it the right language, though? Because Rishi Sunak has gone as far as saying epoch-defining challenge, but is it a threat in the way that uh, Ian Duncan Smith says? Well, I think this is where diplomacy comes in, as I say, to, to try and play those both, both those ride both those horses at the same time, the um, econo economic and foreign policy. Would you use the word threat to describe uh, China or a challenge, as Rishi Sunak says? I think yes, a strategic challenge, because I think there are some things that we need to we need to be very careful about in relation to China, and data is obviously one of them. But there are other things that we need to work with China on. So on. You know, the, threat, the biggest threat to the world, which is climate change, China has to play an absolutely pivotal role. So we need to work with them. So there is no point just saying, and, I, and your point is right too, about mm -hmm. the amount of things that we simply import. I mean, most of our manufacturing industry now is no longer in this country, but is largely in China. Right. Have the politicians got it right in terms of the language to describe China and how we should treat them? I, I'm not sure it's so much about the language, it's just about the, the focus. I mean, even beyond the, the cyber issue, I mean, the, Emily talked about manufacturing. The China is now exporting its industrial surplus in a way that is, well, it, it may be very, very good for chi climate change because it's resulting in incredibly cheap EVs flooding the markets, but it's inc an incredible threat and an incredible challenge to the manufacturing industry in, in many Western it's countries. Right. When, and when, we're just not talking about but, these issues. But it's we, absolutely we, right. We so when it comes to us. electric vehicles, we all need to develop that industry. And if China is simply swamping it, then it kills off in, in industry growing elsewhere. But we did it to ourselves. And I kind of find it quite funny sitting here and finding, a, a, you know, that Paul Scully, you're agreeing with me. We decimated our own industrial base. We decided to rely on China's. And then we're acting surprised as they become a more powerful country wanting to, you know, I express... Um, its power and its interests internationally. That I is the consequence is, of no, economic decisions why you say that? we made. But I think we're still the ninth biggest manufacturer in the world. We, but if you look at actually a lot of African countries, if you look at a lot of Asian countries, and in, indeed Caribbean countries, China has spread that economic power throughout the world, where they've actually, you know, soft loans, they've come in, they've provided Chinese labour rather than uh, indigenous labour to uh, to do all what, like deep sea ports and those kind of things, and imported the secondary industry. So actually those countries are not getting the direct benefit that they were expecting when they were first taking on Chinese power. Well, let's talk about the Israel-Hamas conflict in Gaza. You saw pictures in the headlines of Gazans of Palestinians um, celebrating hopes for a ceasefire. But Let's talk to our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale, because what's actually happened uh, in terms of agreement by both Hamas and the Israeli government? Well, Joe, what happened is that last night Hamas announced uh, unexpectedly that it had agreed to a deal. Uh, now, it wasn't clear precisely what it had agreed to, but it certainly surprised uh, the Israeli side. Uh, they, uh, by all accounts, were not expecting this to happen. Uh, and since then, um, everybody's been scrubbing around trying to work out precisely what deal Hamas has signed up to. The Israelis have said that the, the prime minister's office said that uh, it doesn't meet all of their needs uh, and doesn't meet what, what they're demanding in the negotiations. But the Israelis have decided and agreed to send a delegation of officials to Cairo to continue talking. That, that delegation is flying to Cairo today. So the negotiations continue mm. and a lot of discussion about precisely what uh, Hamas have agreed to and what this actually means in the shape of the negotiations. But in the meantime, we're looking at pictures um, that show Rafa, the area in the south of Gaza, and the Israeli offensive or some sort of offensive that has begun, despite warnings uh, from allies like America and the UK, not to go into that area. 
What's happening at the moment is this morning the Israeli forces have taken over the uh, the Palestinian Gaza side of the Rafah crossing, which is the, the southerly one with Egypt, uh, and. That is seen largely as a preparatory act to control that bit of the jigsaw ahead of any operation if they if the Israelis do go ahead. They're pushing people out. They're encouraging everybody to move on. Uh, it, it's, you know, as you say, against the wishes of uh, the Americans, uh, the Europeans, uh, all sides in, in the Gulf, saying that whatever happens, any kind of military operation in that part of the world where so many people are, are crammed in is not just going to involve uh, a lot of people dying, a lot of civilians dying. It's going to completely damage the humanitarian situation because mm. it's through that su those southern ports that, and those southern entries that all the humanitarian aid that's getting in, that's where most of the bulk of it's coming through. And any kind of military oper operation will shut that down. Any disbursement of people um, uh, outside of Rafa will make it much harder for humanitarian aid to get in. So that's why the Americans have been very, very silent on this latest deal that Hamas have signed up to. But the one thing the Americans haven't been silent over in the last 12, 24 hours is again making clear their, op operation, uh, their opposition to any military operation in Rafa. James Landell, thank you very much. Emily, looking at the situation, it is as it has been uh, six, since October the 7th, incredibly precarious and incredibly dangerous. Um, we don't know the details of the negotiations um, at the moment, but is there anything really that can be done at this point to prevent the Israelis going ahead with some sort of offensive in that southern part of Gaza? Yeah, where there's more than a million people and more than half of them are children, anything that the Israelis are doing in the around Rafa is is going to result unless they're really careful in the deaths of innocent people, and they. You know, what is the reason for this? If there is a, if there's a potential peace process happening, then our concern is, I mean, not only have we been saying for I don't know how long that they must not go into Rafa, but to go in now when potentially there might be a peace process, Hamas has agreed to, you know, some pretty major concessions mm. and they need to sit down and they need to talk. And the rest of the world is putting every effort they can into diplomacy, into putting pressure on Israel. Israel really needs to listen. Right. I mean, the Israeli government broadly would say that it was always intending to go into Rafa to clear the area, uh, they would say, of Hamas terrorists who are operating there, whether the peace process or a deal was met. But j just what can we do? really in this situation to pull back or get the Israelis to pull back from the brink? Well, I think what we've got to do is to make sure that we are um, continuing to talk to Israel, to make sure that they are continuing to talk in, their, in these uh, the, the peace talks, and uh, that's my understanding is that is what they are doing, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that they are there at the table. Um, we don't want to see any more bloodshed. We don't want to see any more bombing from, you know, from our pictures that we're seeing uh, from here. But we've also got to remind Israel of their responsibilities. That yes, that is Rafa is the last Hamas stronghold, uh, and my understanding is that they, when they uh, closed off the area. Uh, yesterday it was because rockets were coming, there was a few rockets fired in mm. from that particular area. And I suspect what's happening, you know, Hamas will clearly be wanting to put the pressure up now, saying we've signed up to this um, mm. this uh, deal, because otherwise um, uh, they want to put the pressure back on Israel. Yeah, sure, and it was striking, the pictures of Gazans themselves celebrating. I mean, they want the fighting <coughs> to stop, uh, and that must put yeah, some pressure yeah, on yeah. Hamas as well in order to bring a deal. Four Israeli soldiers were killed in strikes uh, by Hamas at the Kerem Shalom crossing, which is a different crossing to the Rafah crossing with Egypt, but into uh, Israel. A reminder that the fighting on both sides goes on. I'm sat across from two very, very intelligent people. And unfortunately, the way you're talking is treating people like mugs. You can talk about condemnation all you want. You can talk about reminding Israel of their international obligations all, all you want. But until you're talking about suspending arms sales to Israel, until the Americans are talking about suspending military aid to Israel, all of that finger wagging in the world will not stop Netanyahu from doing what he wants to do, which is launching a, um, an absolutely terrible, abhorrent ground assault on Rafa. The images which are coming out on social media at the moment have been for months from Rafa of children buried under the rubble, um, body parts blown to smithereens. 
this is the result of Israel being emboldened and effectively being given a carte blanche to interpret its, in you know, Emily's words from October 2023, its absolute right to self-defence to mean collectively punishing the Gazan people. Well, Emily? Well, I think that um, two days, three days after the first incursions into, into Israel, when so many people had been killed and there were so many... Um, hostages that had been taken and we were in a live situation well, and there are still hostages and we believed no no but they were yeah. but it was still we didn't I mean there was there was still fighting going on, on the yeah. ground in Israel and there were as far as I understood there was going to be an attempt to get the hostages back yeah. um, at that stage just cut the lights off was, uh, was and to, and so on was to was the right thing to do but as I said at the time and there has been some selective reporting um, it absolutely is not within international law to cut off supplies to a nation so you were asked specifically about food and water yes not just the lights. Yes. and you yes. said it has an absolute right to defend and, itself and 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 as I also said as, as the guy from the UN had said before, I'm sorry for people who hadn't seen the programme, but for the person who was uh, from the UN who was on Newsnight before me had said, within a short period in a war, you can cut off in order to... So, so essentially, if they were going to go into Gaza to try and get the hostages back, then in that very short period, then it would be right to kind of... I mean, and we know that's what Israel has been doing on and off in Gaza anyway. But in this period, that was the thing to do. Not to do it so that you starve people and not to do it so that you cut off their, their power so that they don't have water. I mean, that's, you know, you do it in a short period when you're defending yourself because you have an absolute right to defend yourself. And that's the right thing to do. But it always had to be, as we always said, within the confines of international law. I think that's a bit like saying, I want to burgle this house, but in a lawful way. I think no, these two not. things are, are completely Absolutely contradictory. Not. It's you and got think, my wait, stuff and, in, your, and, in, my, in your house and I'm going in to get it, and, 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 the last, and the last thing that I would say is, I think it is for the birds, the idea that you could not see what would be happening now. What was coming out from Israel in terms of politicians' mouths, the references to Amalek, um, saying that there are no uninvolved civilians, even in those very, very early days, mm -hmm. it was clear that civilians were being considered fair targets. So then when you've got leading politicians saying that the right to self-defence includes cutting of food, includes cutting of water and power, that either means that you were unable to see what millions of other people could see was going to happen, which would make me question the quality of the politicians we have in this country, or there's an element of being disingenuous, or, where you didn't think you had the political well, may, to may say I, this at the start, may I, may I but now you're worried about may the images that. coming okay, out. Okay, so may I answer that? So I think within the short period, of the first few days, when they were trying to get their hostages back, I think there is one thing, and as things move on, we have been completely clear about what it is that we expect. We, we expect there to be a ceasefire. It is not necessary for Israel to continue in this way. Israel had an absolute right to defend itself, but now there needs to be an immediate ceasefire. And we have made that clear. Would you suspend and, well, on, hang on. Well, hang, well, well, I'll well, answer can, that question. Okay. So what I would say is this, is that when we look at some of the images, and I can't sit here in this television studio or in London and decide on a case-by-case -case basis on what, you know, whether there has been a breach of international law here or there or whatever instances, but as a whole, one begins to really be concerned that there may well be some breaches of international law. And if that is right, then what we need to do... And listen, I've been doing this a long time. I did this when, there was, when, they, when, when we were arming Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And what you do is you look at what arms are being sold, are they being used... British arms are being sold. Are they being used in the conflict? And is there a breach of international law? Now, we can see what seems to be on the face of it, breaches of international law. The question then is, what arms are we selling and are they being used? Well, and, that, and, that's, and, and that's quite a difficult and a technical thing that needs to be done. And that's, why, that, really, and that's yeah. why we want to see the, we want to see the advice. Right. So that we can see the stages that have been gone through to see whether or not we are selling arms that are being used mm. in breach of international law. Uh, Robert Ash says that everybody could see what was going to unfold, what the Israeli government was set on doing, its war cabinet. But at the time, there, were, there was widespread criticism that actually uh, the Israelis uh, suffering that massacre, 1,200 people murdered and 200-odd hostages taken, half of whom, or nearly half of whom, are still somewhere in uh, Gaza, that actually Israel wasn't given uh, quite enough scope to respond before the criticisms came in, in the way that Ash has outlined. Yeah, so I don't think anyone would... Um, I mean, what's happening at the moment is, is horrible, and everyone, everyone would agree with that. But you keep on saying, in the early days. In the early days, Israel suffered a monstrous attack. It was a... Cr I mean, you're talking about crimes against international law. By my God, the things that happened were 
horrendous. And, and there were people cheering. In this country, there were people who were cheering that. Before Israel had done a single thing to respond, there were people who were, who were hailing this as a blow against the oppressors, who were, you know, as a, as a writing of, of historic, uh, historic wrongs. From, and that was, you know, and you, you talk about a ceasefire. From Israel's point of view, um, I mean, especially in the early days, but sort of even now, a ceasefire that leaves Hamas in charge of Gaza and gives them the ability to start firing rockets again, to start making more raids, to commit more crimes against humanity in their own country. That's not a, that's not a ceasefire in their eyes. I mean, I think they, they, these are you know, people in that country are deeply traumatized by what happened on, on October the, the 7th. And that's not excuse. And also, you know, the and I think the way that in which I mean, not saying in, in this debate, but the way in which quite a lot of people conflate the actions of the Netanyahu government with the state of Israel, with with the Jewish people is a, is a really serious issue. But the impact here on domestic politics is also clear, uh, and that was demonstrated in part in the local elections. We can show you pictures of uh, victorious councillors who stood as independents, um, particularly with an eye on what is going on uh, in Israel and in Gaza, uh, some of whom uh, were former Labour councillors, and Labour lost its overall majority in Oldham Council for the first time time in 30 years. Just how damaging is that, Emily? Look, we don't want to, to lose people. We don't want to lose support. Obviously, we don't, and we fight for... But everything. how are you going to win them back? I think that in Oldham, there's been... We, Oldham has been slipping away from us for, for some time, actually, and that is... You know, that's a worry. I think that in Rochdale, we've had George Galloway going around saying he's going to wipe Labour out of Roch Rochdale. And he's the Workers' Party of Britain. And MP he is the person Rochdale. who spins the most extraordinary things against Labour. Um, um, and uh, and we, need to, we need to counter it. And we need to be clear about what our position is. And we need to be in dialogue with people and explain what it is that we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. Robert? So I don't, if you look at the actual electoral demographics, I don't think this is going to cost Keir Starmer his, his majority. Um, there, are obviously people, there, are, there, there are obviously people who feel very strongly about this, but, um, but bluntly speaking, hev heavily Muslim areas also tend to be incredibly Labour voting. Um, so you have to, you, you know, if, even if you lop off quite a lot out, out of the Muslim vote, it doesn't cost Labour that many seats. But I, what I think this is an interesting sign of is the way that under, if, assuming Labour form the next government, as I think everyone is assuming at this, this point, the pressure on it will come from the left. It will be the, the, it, in just the way that when the Tories are in power, the pressure come, comes from the right. It's, all, it's always the base that drives, that drives part of the conversation. I mean, do you agree with that, Ash? I mean, the figures, in areas where the Muslim population is larger than 20%, the Labour share was 21% less. I know it's stats here, but less compared to the 2021 local elections. So it's gone down. It's gone down quite considerably. But is Robert right that in the end, at a general election, it won't matter much? I think it will vary a lot on a seat-by-seat -seat basis. I think that people are right to identify that there were particular local issues in Rochdale and Oldham as well. But I think the broad picture that Muslims feel intensely betrayed and disappointed by Labour over the issue of Gaza is certainly the case. Uh, there's a reason why those leaflets printed with Keir Starmer's own words from that LBC interview. He said, I do think Israel has that right in reference to cutting off Even food, though food Emily and Keir Starmer have clarified, as they would put it, what that meant, and they now have a statement that calls for an immediate ceasefire and the immediate release of all hostages and unimpeded aid into Gaza, you don't think that, that cut through? I don't think that it is cutting through. And the reason why is because people interpret that as trying to cover your own back after the um, horrors of, pal well, of what's going on in yeah, Gaza but have been but made you see, clear the thing to the is, world. Not, that's not true. And so, that's and what so people think of us. Yeah, and that's why it's important for us to engage and for us to talk to people and explain, you know, that in the initial stages of a of a war, when but, as you as, as has been said so well, you know, Israel was under attack in the way that it was. So many people were killed. There were so many horrors, and Israel had the right to defend itself and try and get its, yeah. get its hostages. So why back could those well, angry people see on. something you there's, couldn't? There's a broader, but, but there's a broader question here because the the conservative share uh, was 11 percent less, and independent candidates increased their share by 25 percent. Um, as well. But the broader question is the amount that the issue is being discussed and is perhaps at the front of, of some people's minds in terms of local elections and whether that stays. Is it healthy to have increasing amounts of politics based on religious or ethnic lines? Well, I think that 
reducing it to a religious issue is wrong. There are also lots of young people who aren't Muslim who feel profoundly morally outraged by what's going on, and it's their democratic and right to, people and to, old people to, yeah. to Do vote on that basis. Watching the television said Muslim just says, you were let just down. says mm -hmm. make it stop. This is terrible. Look at look what's going on. We must make it stop. We must be able to do something. Think... You talked about once no go areas. Mm. Now I know you you corrected it or you clarified it. What did you mean? Well, what I was talking about is there are certain areas where there's a small minority of people um, who basically um, give rise to a wider prejudice for people who then choose not to go into a particular area. Can you name a no-go area? Based on, based yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 it's not. No, 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 no. If they're in London, I'd like to know if I've been there. You're exactly mistaking what I'm saying. People are choosing, in some, there might be because they're going into an area where there are young people and older people feel intimidated. It might be, uh, you know, Jewish people not wanting to go in one area. It might, Which what area? I'm saying, um, areas around them. No, no, but areas what, which them. area? Just, no, just, just I'm not going to go place. back. I'm not going to go back into that. I'm not going back into that because actually you're you're trying to portray this into something that it's not. If you, no, I'm if just you, asking what you're saying. If you genuinely think there's there no, no go area. If you genuinely think there's no prejudice in this country because that is driven by headlines based on a minority of people who are skewing people's views. That was the point I was trying to get across. I'm not talking about individual areas. I'm not going to get into that because that just takes us into a totally different direction. Because and it's really. So no, no, go areas. It's really unhelpful on tackling prejudice. If you actually think, I tell you what, this country is fine, there's no prejudice, then we've got a real problem. Obviously, course, I don't think that. But just name the no go problem, area. Though, when when you had you know, some of the far right politicians in America saying that there are no go areas in London, which you why, get, and this is why exactly why I apologise for using the term. Right, because what right. I didn't mean to use it for is in that basis. Because you can go anywhere, anywhere in London. London. I mean, you're, 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 and I, mean, you're, I feel, and I mean, I feel free to do that. Your shadow cabinet colleague West Streeting said a victory for Susan Hall and Conservatives. Would be would cause would cause racists, white supremacists, and Islamophobes all over the world to be rejoicing. Yeah. I mean, if that's not divisive, I don't know what is. Yeah. yeah. What did you What did you think when you when you heard that from Wes? I think it was a, was it a tweet that yeah. he put out? I yes. think he apologised for it. But he did. you know, I'm I not mean, sure he's apologised for it. I think he yeah, doubled down in I, at least two subsequent tweets. Well, well I, I mean, I think that it's it's unfortunate when the Conservatives select a candidate who likes what Enoch Powell has said. I think that she is divisive, and I think that many of the things that she has said have been just irresponsible, given the nature of London and the importance of having a leader in London who pulls people together and doesn't deliberately try and divide them. Right, and she and was the Tories' candidate uh, for London Tory there, lost to May I also Carl. say, you know, a member of those six appalling Facebook groups who were, well, you know, pushing out racist stuff against Sadiq particularly. Paul, were you disappointed? Um, obviously, you were disappointed that you weren't uh, the candidate, the Conservative candidate uh, for London mayor. Would you have done a better job? Well, what I'm really disappointed about, I'm frustrated as a Londoner, and I'm frustrated the fact that we didn't have the contest that we could have had, uh, that Londoners deserved, frankly. Um, and so, whether I'd have done a better job running close, uh, I, I, I think I most people know. in the Conservative but, tribe would say that Paul would have done a better job. But we needed, but we needed that debate because actually, the, you were talking about should uh, religion or whatever uh, have a uh, feature in some of these discussions, these devolution debates. It gets away from the things that we can actually uh, uh, tackle. We, you know, we, there's no way a local councillor can tackle a ceasefire in Gaza, but we can tackle housing, transport, tr transport, and crime in London. We can talk about uh, the local issues in those local areas and actually it just confuses the voters when if they're sitting there thinking well am I going on national basis am I voting on an international basis well whereas I've got to live now with those councillors for the next four years well, in let, my local area. well we've talked uh, a lot about Labour in terms of the impact of the local uh, elections on uh, the party standing in some of those councils um, what about the Tories and the governing party um, you heard both Suella Braverman the former Home Secretary and the Prime Minister giving their verdict let's just uh, have a listen again I talk to many of my colleagues who are privately demoralised and incredibly concerned about the prospects. We are, at this rate, you know, we'll be lucky to have any Conservative MPs at the next election. And we need to fight. And I'm not willing to give up. I, you know, it does me no favours to come here and say it how it is and to set out the difficult situation that we're in. Whilst, of course, this was a disappointing weekend for us, the, the result of the next general election isn't a foregone conclusion and indeed actually is closer than, or the situation is closer than many people are saying or indeed some of the opinion polls 
are predicting, and that's why I'm absolutely determined to fight incredibly hard for what I believe and for the future country that I want to build, and that's what I'm going to do. So who's right, Paul? Is it Suella saying you'll have no uh, Tory MPs left, perhaps, or Rishi Sunak saying it's much closer than it seems? What I find really frustrating, there's a kernel in both of what they said, that the, um, yet they are talking uh, at cross-purposes, totally o over each other's heads. Because there is a scenario that you can get to if we uh, come up with a vision, if we actually sell that vision to the country, rather than just going from crisis to crisis and trying to manage those crises, that you can get towards a hung parliament or, or reduce the losses. I, I do... Well, no, I do believe that, you know, my, my personal view is that Labour's going to win the election, but there is that scenario, if you've got the vision. So you don't think there's a vision so, uh, now, but you do want to stick with Rishi I've Sunak. I've been talking about building a vision for weeks now, uh, and, uh, and you know, Rishi has time to change that, but, it, but time is way, well, way, way... Well, when you say he has out. time to change it, what sort of change are you talking about? I'm talking about explaining why we are doing what we're doing. We're not, you, can't, you cannot just win an election for the sake of winning elections. In the same way, when I was running businesses, uh, you know, years ago, it, I don't, you don't set up a business just to make money. You will always fail if you do that. You run a business because you've got a good business idea and a profit comes out as a byproduct. In the same way, you win an election because you've got good ideas, you're selling those ideas, you've got the vision. Right. Is, is it time to change the direction of the Conservative Party? Those results were dismal. It was a very poor performance for the Conservative Party, whichever way uh, you look at them. The response and the reaction, it looks as if a leadership challenge isn't going to happen. And that was fairly obvious in the early hours of uh, Friday morning. What do you think should change? Well, it's what's weird is if you look at what Suello and others are asking for, Rishi Sunak is already at least theoretically committed to trying to deliver them. He is, they say we need to cut taxes, we need to lower immigration, we need to spend more on defence, we need to try and fix the NHS, we need to you know, tackle woke ideology. All, all of those are things which the government is, is, is trying to do. So what you're really saying is it should just be trying harder or it should be, you know, it should be actually delivering. I think there is a... You know, there is definitely, I think there is definitely a consensus within the Tory party that it's too late to change leader. Not least because voters' problems are frankly with the Conservative Party just as much as they are, or even more than they are mm. with, with, with Rishi Sunak. In, in, in fact, the evidence is that the people who are still voting Conservative actually rather like him. And there, there are just as many people who have defected from the Tories who still like, you know, who, who, who might l like him but not the party as like the party but, but not him. Like, there's, no, there's no obvious al alternative. I think, the, I think the obvious thing which we may... I mean, Rachel Reeves has been talking about today is, is it's the economy. Like, uh, you know, if, you know the, the thing which will determine whether the Tories are absolutely crushed or, have a, 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 or even get to a hung parliament is whether people actually feel that things are going in the right direction. And the economy is... And, you know, economy and HS waiting this... Just the day-to-day -day lived experience is what tends to determine... And, the, and there are a lot of people who think, actually, Labour are offering more of the same, uh, not radically different. But this line about the coalition of chaos uh, that's beginning to be resurrected from the 2015 election, which seemed to work against Ed Miliband, do you think that will work as an attack line this time? I don't think it will. I mean, when I saw the Tories going with that line, I really felt like, oh, God, my time machine works. It's just <laughs> taken us back um, nearly a decade. It shows you how little the Conservative Party has managed to move on and, and get with the times. In some ways, I feel kind of sorry for Rishi Sunak because him and Jeremy Hunt aren't really a government at all. They're a crisis management team with a parliamentary wing and they were sort of brought in to try and clean up the mess caused by Liz Truss. The awful truth is that it's not just Rishi Sunak's fault and it's not just Liz Truss's fault either. The Conservatives have been on a downward trend in terms of polling since December 2021. So that's under Boris Johnson. And it's since then that you guys have been lurching from crisis to crisis and you haven't had any animating purpose or vision or strategy. And I think that this idea that it could be saved by a different leader, that's for the birds. Well, I think the idea that Suella Braverman is um, pained by having to go <laughs> on TV and stick the boot in, also for the birds. Um, I well, really well, don't well, see well, a, well, a way forward well, for you. Well, actually, uh... I agree with the middle bit of what you were just saying there about the fact that is uh, you know that is about vision. It's about narrative. It's about tying these things through uh, to talk about. Is the there economy, time? The is there time? And is anyone Possib listening? Look, possibly not, and possibly not. Uh, the, the honest answer to those. I've been saying for a little while that people are stopping listening. I joined the Conservative Party two weeks after the 1997 election, so I was one of those people that stopped listening myself. And then uh, you know back then, and I fear that we're not learning those lessons. But actually, if you're going to have a hope of talking to people, and we were talking a little bit earlier about younger people uh, in London. We're not talking about younger, to mm. younger people, mm. about their aspirations, 
at all. We, we rarely talk about housing, something I know wow. Robert is exercised <laughs> about. Um, and we, it's, it's, it's about getting back to telling people we are doing this for a reason, not just for ourselves, not just to win our seats or the election and get back into number 10 or whatever, or reduce losses. It's we are doing this for public service to make our country better according to our principles. Emily? Yeah, I mean, I think the results were completely beyond Labour's expectations. We did, we did really well and we were very pleased. But the idea that this results in potentially a hung parliament is for the birds. I mean, they, it, it is, it's... it's so what really sort of majority are, are you thinking you're going to win? Well, we would, nobody, nobody has voted yet. But, you know, if you look at those elections, so you, they voted in local elections, but they haven't mm -hmm. voted in the national one yet. All we can go on is the by-elections and the last six by-elections where, you know, we have done remarkably well. Um, and in the and in the local elections, we mm. did remarkably well. But uh, the idea that somehow or other you can extrapolate from the local elections that we're going to have a hung parliament, mm. they're clutching at straws. All they need to do is talk to people, as I do, up and down the country, who say the, co the Tories are done. Right. We've had enough. That, we want, we, we've had enough of this government. Yeah. We okay. want to move on. Yeah. Call one, an election. One thing that That's what Ellis, everybody says. One thing that Sir Weller said in that same interview, which st struck me actually, which I, I've seen myself when I've been out door knocking, is mm. about our voters on strike. So I'm not sh sure that actually there's um, that is quite what Emily's saying in terms of. Oh, I think I seriously of, of think Tories, I've met three people on the doorstep who say they're going to vote Labour, so vote, vote Conservative in the last couple of months. But Honestly, you know, Emily, well, I mean, a lot of people who say elections are not the same. No, no, absolutely, but people do vote in different ways. Absolutely. This is, but this is, what killed, this is what killed the Tories. In, this is what killed the Tories in '97. It wasn't that everyone who'd voted Tory in '92 suddenly went, you know what? That Tony Blair, I really like the look of him. I'm going to vote Labour. There were people who did that. But what happened to the Tories between '92 and '97 was their vote went down from roughly 14 million to roughly 9 million because their voters stayed at home. And that is what it looks like is, is going to happen this time. Right. Well, in terms still... of getting people switching, though, we're getting people switching. Some of them well, switched to reform, but actually more of them are switching to Labour. Right. I mean, the the issue of the economy. It's the economy stupid, as you were saying, uh, Rob. But do you think Labour are making, Ash, a big enough, a bold enough offer to the electorate when it comes to the economy? They are making enough of an offer to win the next general election. Basically, you just need a dog with a red rosette and you'd probably win because people hate the Tories. Are they doing enough to address the deep systemic issues of this country? The answer is no. I mean, if you, if you go around and you talk to people not... Who are you going to vote for? Mm. What's going on in your life? Do you feel hopeful about the direction of society? The answer to that is largely, no, I don't feel hopeful about the direction of society. And I think if you ask people, do you feel positive about the message Labour is putting out? The answer is also no. You don't make pledges without backing down on them. You uh, treat many of your core voters with disdain, with negative briefings against Muslim voters and young voters whenever you think things aren't going your way. And you've mistaken, I think, people's loathing of the Conservative Party mm -hmm. as love for Labour, that will be enough to get you over the line in, you know, for a first term in office. Will it keep you well, there? Emily? I'd say no. I don't think I've ever briefed against young people. Or not you, voters. not you, but senior Sorry, Labour sources what you're do. Well, but then, Emily, think can I... Can people I, in the shadows, I don't know, we know, I mean... <laughs> well, let, me, no po idea. let me point you to this, because this is an important part of what Labour is offering, or says it's going to offer, in The Guardian, scaling back Labour's workers' rights plan. This is a plan uh, largely from Angela Rayner, the deputy leader, would be disastrous, warns the TUC president. Um, is that what's going to happen? You are no. going to scale back before the election? No, it's not. Right. No, put we're really proud heart. of it. Absolutely. We're really proud of it. It's a central part of our manifesto and we think that it is part of our, the way in which we're going to transform this economy. Right. I mean, they, you've got it set out here, in fact, when I find it. Um, there are here. Labour will bring in the right to switch off and work autonomously. You're still going to do that? Mm -hmm. Labour will update trade union legislation, so it's whatever that means, fit for a modern economy. Labour well, so will strengthen the law to like enforce can, workplace so that, so, rights. So that you can vote in trade union votes online. I mean, you can do it for Tory leadership, but the Tories won't let trade unionists vote online. You all have to turn up <coughs> at the meeting and so on. And then you have to get a certain proportion of trade unionists to actually vote one way or the other, when actually if they were working from home, they'd much rather vote online. All right, and Labour will strengthen rights and protections for workers and the self-employed. You'll ban zero-hours contracts and end hire and... Well, sorry, fire and rehire. Um, and you'll make flexible working a day one right. That is all going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't sound yeah, no, it is. Yeah, no, no, emphatic. I mean, sorry, um, I thought I was I just, sorry, so yes, emphatic about yes, it before. Yes, I didn't think I, I just, needed to do it again. I oh, know. Well, these, <laughs> are, these are different things. Do you welcome that? I think this is... One of the 
One of the real successes in this country over the last decade and more has been our record on employment. Even with the recent surge in inactivity, we still have a really, really good record of employment, and that's partly due to our, our labour market model. We make it much, we make it much, we, we make it much easier for people to take on new new employees, and we don't impose too too many burdens. What I worry about, and what other people are worried about, including businesses, is that. But, you know, for example, by taking away the, the ability to have sort of probationary periods, giving people full workplace protections from day one, it will, that, that, that sort of thing will not only in, increase costs to business, but it will lead businesses to think twice before making hiring decisions. We've, you can't have French employment protections, yeah. and you may have French, if you have French we've, employment protection, no, no, you may have I French mean, unemployment we've as never, well. We've never said that we're not going to have probationary periods. If you have a probationary period before you get your job, that's, and we need to make sure that someone can actually do the uh -huh. job before. So that's, but, but what we won't be, it, what's happened is that we're getting now a level of in-work poverty. People are working for their poverty. And we need to make sure that people, that we cut back. We don't have these zero hours contract where people just don't know how much but they're going most, to earn. The, the evidence is most people who are on zero hours contracts are on zero hours contracts by choice. They're people like students or they're people that absolutely, every, the government's done investigations into this. I mean, they're, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean they're not asking anybody that I know who's working on a zero hours contract. And quite frankly, you know, they don't feel that they have any choice because, they, because, the, because the model has changed so much. When it used to be, that, like, for example, if you worked in a pub, it would be you'd work three evenings a week, and that would be your that would be your job. Now it is, well, we'll ring you up when we need you. And seriously, that's the difference. And people don't say, actually, I'd rather work three three evenings a week, and I'd rather have those. They go, well, we're sorry, we'll get someone else. Right. And I, it's I, all, think, I, think, I think it's around half of zero hours contract workers would prefer to have a contracted job where their hours are protected. So I'm not saying that nobody yeah. um, doesn't want a zero hours uh, job. And I'm sure that you can craft legislation in such a way which has flexibility for students, as you said. But the fact is, is that there is a significant chunk of people in zero hours employment who want something more stable and protected. And that is not what is being offered to them in but the this, labour but this market. But is, this is the central tension, tension for Labour. You've got Labour saying, we're going to have an amazing, th uh, amazing revolution in workers' rights. But you've also got Rachel Reeves today saying, we are going to work in partnership with business to um, remove barriers to investment. So, you yeah, know, yeah. And they, 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 yes, but, but you know, business is saying very clearly that, they, that these, these measures will, will impose way. more barriers the point on, is it's a on employment. This will, the, come the against, point is it's a this will come against the face of reality at some point when it ah, comes to it. Do you think it will? Program. Well, if, if, that's, if this is what's going to uh, well, be coming is, in early day legislation, work, fair work, decent once work, you actually safe start, work. Safe start work. seeing some real worked up examples about this, oh. uh, I'm not saying they, they can't make some changes, but I think... We're going to introduce this legislation in the first hundred days, I'm telling you. Things like fire and rehire, for example. You know, I was the minister that tackled this for two and a half years. And uh, fire and rehire, basically, if you scrap it in, in its entirety, as the Labour Party wants to do, rather than just getting rid of the extreme horrible uh, examples that we had, p &O ferries and those kind of... You haven't got rid of that, Then actually, you? what you end up with is just fire. You don't end up with but, a rehire. But, Ash, do you think Labour will stick to it? I mean, Robert seems to think they will, but they shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> you think they should, but do you think they will? You know what? There's a first time for everything. And if Keir Starmer <laughs> sticks to this promise, I'll be very happy indeed. There's just one last thing I want to say. Mm. There are other countries with much stronger workplace protections, with better sick pay, better maternity pay, more protections uh, for early workers. Then? Well, I'd say in Scandinavian countries, you have businesses there, and more importantly, you have a quality and they have of a life very there different, and where they have people an entirely say, different we approach. would like to emulate that. So they have an entirely different approach, because we actually have a tribunal system. You'll have to entirely unwork the, um, and undo the tribunal system. And how strong is our around. tribunal so you're system? Almost getting, so what we're doing, we, we are tackling things after the issue, so people can take people to tribunal. Yeah, you're don't. almost having to ask permission before you can take people on in, other, in some other countries. Well, let's bring everyone back to today. And uh, rail strikes chaos, says the Daily Mail, brings Britain's creaking train lines to a halt with commuters battling rush hour travel hell as militant union stages fresh wave of walkouts amid pay row. Um, would you just pay them more, Emily, if you win the election? We would make sure they sat down and talked properly. Oh, yeah. But everyone, everyone's got employers... to the sitting down and the talking yeah, but they, like we but are. They're not doing it. So what happens is that the mm. that the rail that the rail bosses were told essentially by government well, that they had to you know rip up all of the conditions, all of the you know all of the, the carefully negotiated work related rules, and they were to rip all of those up, and then they would be able to talk. And it was like the unions just said no. Right. So that, will the decades. strikes end within the first hundred days of a Labour government if you win? I don't know, but we will sit down. And talk to them properly. Right, we'll so look they them might. The and talk to them properly. So they might continue. I mean, why hasn't uh, the Tory government resolved this? I mean, really? Well, it's uh, because I think it's the intransigence, intransigence uh, in between. We've had this, some of this is politically motivated. I've seen this before in, in, 
in my area a few years ago, again, when we're talking about driverless, um, guardless trains, which had been, uh, and they went on strike in Sutton, on the line in Sutton, despite the fact they hadn't had a guard on the train for 20 years. So, um, you know, it becomes more political uh, rather than actually focused on the actual issues that you can solve. The rules around the railways have been built up over many years of negotiations, and the all difficulty right. is, is the, 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 the rail unions look at it and say, you want to get rid of all of this? Well, we'll find out, of course, at what happens at the election. That is, that's all for today. I'll be back tomorrow with coverage of the first Prime Minister's question since the local elections, and that's at the earlier time of 11.15. Bye-bye.